All right, my name is Phil. I like to talk about politics and another uh, look at your statements, views, questions. And this one, of course, about trade talks. I was talking about this yesterday. Um, ministers have been talking about trade talks with the EU, but also with Japan in fairly optimistic terms to counter the fact that the US trade talks, which were initially optimistic, are now a bit more pessimistic. It sort of seems to be there has to be some optimistic talks and some pessimistic ones, maybe. So I'm going to go through some of your comments first. I'll split it into the ones relating to the Japanese talks first and then the EU ones. Um, so someone, first of all, saying here regarding the Japanese deal, which may or may not happen. I do have to say right off the bat that um, the Japanese minister who was engaging in these talks has now left the UK. Uh, we don't have agreement. That doesn't mean to say we won't get, but we haven't got it according to the initial deadline for the talks. So uh, whether we get one at all or not, I don't know. Someone here said, does this mean the UK will be getting vending machines full of soiled panties? Hmm. Yeah, I'm not, I mean, I know there's been a lot of talk when it comes to trade deals of food standards. Not sure we've really had the conversation about the standards of, of underwear at point of sale. So I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that one. Um, next one, I suppose a little bit more serious, says, do we have any detail on the Japanese deal? The 0.7%, by the way, uh, reminds me of the forecast TTP, CP, TTP, uh, figure which we in New Zealand worked out to be so small to be reliably modelled. However, the disadvantages of the deal were easily quantifiable since they were fairly substantial. Yeah, I mean, we have... Um, it is, of course, far too small. I mean, even 0.7% would be too small. It's a bit like when the, the government was, was saying that the, you know, the benefits of the US deal would be um, up to 0.2% on our GDP. You know? and, and you think, well, within the margin for error, that could actually be negative. What you're saying is that it's, it could be negative, and this is also true. Um, yes, the, the result... Of, you know, if, if they're going to say that a particular trade deal with a major trading partner, Japan is, of course, not our top trading partner on the side of the world, but it is a major trading partner. Um, and for it to only add 0.07%, according to a calculation, which is not based at the moment on a final deal, remember, even much less being based on... You know, we won't get a, a definitive one until many years after the deal has been implemented because you need to see what the actual effect is. And it is, yeah, you, you know, the margin for error on that could easily send it negative. Absolutely. Definitely, yes. Um, but in terms of what detail we know, I don't know, not a lot. Because although we're told by Liz Truss, who is the uh, cabinet minister in charge of these particular talks, we're told that most areas have been agreed, which may well be true. We haven't been told what those areas are. You know, uh, what we tend to get reported is what are the sticking points. So at the moment, I mean, I, I read that Japan wants to limit our exports um, from the farming sector, for example, uh, agricultural products. Now, the UK government was not so keen on that. So that's one area of disagreement at the moment. Now, Liz Truss, who, as I say, is the cabinet minister in charge of this, did specifically say, however, that the deal would open up extra trade in financial services, digital and e-commerce. And she specifically said that it would go significantly beyond the EU-Japan deal. However, I have not seen anything offered up as proof of that. And again, it could be one of these things where you would say, of course, until something is actually agreed, then nothing has been agreed. It's all right saying we've agreed most of the points. It's now just the fine details to sort out, which, as I say, may well be true. And it may well be that in a few weeks time we actually have agreement and, and it all gets ratified by the end of the year and in place for June, January the 1st next year. That may well be the case. But until everything has been agreed, until 100 percent of things have been agreed, then effectively nothing has been agreed. It's only been agreed in principle because um, if there's even one sticking point where both sides are entrenched and won't shift, then there is no agreement. And even if there were, if, you know, either 
um, legislators on either side, whether it be parliament in this country, who will just go along with whatever Boris Johnson says. Um, but even Japanese legislators, if they suddenly decide they don't like it, well, it still won't be ratified, will it? So, yeah, we, we haven't seen anything in terms of what has been agreed, but uh, I don't think you ever really would until the whole thing is agreed anyway. Next one, which is very, very pertinent, a number of people phrase this one. It says, how can the Japanese give us a better deal than the EU without violating their agreement with the EU? And the simple answer to that, of course, is that they cannot. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, there's a couple of sides to this. First of all, you can just argue just in terms of empirical thinking. Let us imagine that Japan agreed greater market access for the UK in any areas at all than it has granted the EU. The EU, which is the much more important customer, will say, hang on a minute, what's this about? Uh, it's a little bit like, um, you know, let's say you're a builder. I'm going to use this example because my girlfriend works for a company that produces tiles, bricks, things like that for the building industry. So let's say you are a builder and you buying your bricks from a particular place and and you buy an awful lot of them. And then you hear that a different builder who doesn't buy as many bricks as you got a better deal. They got a bigger discount than you did. You won't be very happy. You'll be going to them and go, hang on a minute. We, we want that discount. In fact, we want a better discount than them. We're a much bigger company. We, we buy far more of your products than they do. We should have a better discount. So you'll have that, but that's empirical thinking. The actual text of the EU-Japanese agreement here. Um, it says, and I'll quote it, where a party grants a larger or faster tariff reduction, higher quota or any other more favourable treatment than that provided for under this agreement to a third country, that'd be us, based on an international agreement for goods covered by paragraph three, which affects the balance in the European Union's or Japan's market of such goods, the party shall, with a view to ensuring that the other party obtains at least the same preference, commence such a review within three months of the date of entry into force of the international agreement between the European Union and that third country or between Japan and that third country and will conduct the review with the aim of concluding it within six months of the same date. What that means is, let's say Japan agree a better deal. Now, this is on goods, but they agree a better deal for us. The EU will then conduct a review. Now, basically, that's, an ask, that's a hassle for, the, for Japan. So Japan will basically have to engage in more talks with the EU on an agreement it already has. Um, that is a massive hassle that they can be doing without. So they're not obviously, and they've said as much as well. They have said as much. They are not going to give us a better deal than the EU, uh, that, that they've given to the EU or, or have agreed with the EU. However, there is another line about services, which also reads, each party shall accord to entrepreneurs of the other party and to covered enterprises treatment no less favourable than it accords in like situations to entrepreneurs of a third country and to their enterprises with respect to establishment in its territory. Um, so they can't give us a better deal on services either um, without a lot of hassle. So realistically, they won't. They've said they won't as well. Um, I have no doubt, however, that Liz Truss will, and the government will claim that we've got a better deal. Obviously, anyone who then gets looks at an analysis by uh, an international trade expert may learn differently, but the general members of the public will not. Um, next one says, uh, get real, Japanese are excellent businessmen. Um, Japanese politicians aren't ruined after solution for the next six months, they have long-term interest. So what will they get out of an agreement with the UK? Be okay to deliver cars from Japan directly without tariffs, which means they can run down Nissan and Honda UK after the change of the next car models because it will not be relevant to run those assembly plants without the tariff-free access to Europe. The extra cost to run a production for the small UK market these brands alone will be far higher than a few transporters. Now, okay, there are a few things to this. I sort of agree and disagree with some bits of it. So, the first point about Japanese politicians aren't ruined after a solution for the next six months. Um, I mean, politically speaking, this is not particularly charged for them. It's very, very important for our politicians because 
if they get to, say, the end of next January, one year after we've left the EU, and this will also be several weeks after we've left the transition period, and we still don't have a trade agreement, not, not one little trade agreement in all that time, then it will be quite easy for people like me to point out to the fact that actually we gave up hundreds of them, and if in a whole year we can't even get one, and, uh, you know, the rate of progress is not exactly high. Um, whereas Japan don't have that pressure. They don't have that pressure to come up with something. That being said, the transition period timer is still ticking, and the UK market, uh, by value, is 2.1% of Japanese exports. You know, we're not their main market. Of course not. Uh, just like they are not our main market, but it is also not to be ignored. They will want an agreement that at least protects that share of their exports, at the very least. So agreeing to something that's very similar to what we already have with the EU, even if it's just a short-term or time-limited arrangement, uh, I would have thought would be very important for Japan to agree. Um, but anyway, in terms of, of, you know, one of the more visible, as you point out here, uh, aspects to Japanese-UK trade is the car industry. We have Japanese car manufacturers based in the UK, not so many as we did uh, a few years ago. And, and some who are still there have already made the decision to leave, but not all. Now, from one point of view, make a very, very good point about the fact that the reason they did that was actually largely for selling in the EU market. That will not be possible because we will not be part of the single market. So that friction-free trade won't exist. There'll be tariffs on it. It won't happen. So they can't do it for that. Now, when you talk about the UK market being too small for them, that is actually an interesting point because one of the Japanese car manufacturers, I, I think it was Nissan, but don't quote me. I actually forget which one it was. I'm pretty sure, though, it was Nissan. But one of them did actually say that they were waiting to see how Brexit turned out, not just because of to see how we agree with the EU, because there is a bit of a, a, a belief that if other car manufacturers pull out of the UK then that potentially could leave a larger share of the UK car market for someone who stays. So this company, I'm trying to do it from memory, I'm afraid now, uh, but I'm pretty sure they were thinking if they could increase their share of the market, and it would have to be substantial, because of other operators leaving the UK, then it could be worthwhile them still having a presence in the UK. Obviously, that doesn't mean the UK as a whole benefits because it would still represent a large net exodus of, U of car manufacturing in the UK. But it would mean that there would be the potential benefit for having something there. However, as you also then point out, let's say we agree a free trade arrangement on cars at the very least. And then it becomes possible for Japan to make that manufacture those cars in Japan and transport them to the UK tariff-free. They just have to pay the cost of transport, which is significant, but not necessarily as significant as, as setting up in the UK. Then, uh, then, yeah, if we agree to that, then, again, they may decide, even if they can increase their share of the UK car market, it's still not worth sticking around. I, I, I don't know the answer to that one. Um, but, yeah... Uh, I, I still would say that Japan does want to conclude an agreement. Of course they do. So would anyone. Is it important enough for them to really concede anything substantial? Probably not. Probably not. Um, now, from the UK, you could argue the same thing because the Japanese market is also uh, it's significant. We don't want to mess about. But at the same time, is it large enough for us to make major concessions as well? Again, probably not, except, of course, for that political dimension. Our ministers are desperate to wave a piece of paper in the air and say we have a trade agreement. Um, and although Dominic Raab recently tried to laud the fact that we had one with Liechtenstein, I think the government know they're going to have to do a bit better than that. Um, <clears throat> then the next one is saying here, 
the, I think I echoed this one actually. The government will claim we have a better deal than the EU with Japan, regardless of whether we do or not. I suspect that it will go along the lines of we have a world leading deal. I don't wish to be pedantic, but I believe the current phraseology is world beating deal. But yes, I have no doubt that that will be the case. Um, we, yeah, um, whatever we get will be bill. We will accept. We will accept something that's basically the same, and we will just claim that it is better. I think for that reason, the government would like something that's not just a copied and paste job. So all the agreements we have so far with other countries, the most notable of which is Switzerland, are literally just copied and pasted from the agreement we had as members of the EU, and have at the moment as you know, uh, in the transition period. Uh, we literally just scrubbed out wherever it said European Union and crossed it out and put United Kingdom. Um, but they're the same deals. I think they'll want the, some th some aspect of it to change. And it will almost not really matter whether it's better or worse for us, as long as it's different. So they can say, ah, oh, this thing, we've got this thing. We, we, we negotiated this thing. That being said, uh, it also has to be said that Liz Truss, who is the government minister in charge of these negotiations, is the same Conservative MP who, before the Brexit referendum, said that there isn't a single Brexit supporter, because she was not a Brexit supporter, there was not a single Brexit supporter can tell me how we can possibly and whom we can possibly get a better trade deal from than as part of the EU. And now she's the person who's got to somehow conjure one up. Then on to some uh, quick statements about the EU. There'll be plenty more time for all of these because these are the big ones, of course. Um, someone's saying here, the EU has to back down. The UK backed down the last three times. Now it's the EU's turn, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's how it works. Yeah, you're quite right. It must be our turn now. Yeah. The EU's, the, uh, you're right, I'm, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm placated now. The EU has to back down. It is their turn. Yeah. Next one. Would the EU even agree to a free trade deal without free movement of people? I mean, in terms of services, no. <laughs> in terms of goods, uh, no, potentially. Um, the problem is, at the moment, we don't really have time to properly negotiate any sort of free trade deal as such uh, unless it is just a carbon copy of the transition period but that means following all the rules still um, is it possible to agree a free trade deal on anything goods or services with the eu without agreeing to relevant eu rules now i mean the eu have made this quite clear we don't have to agree to all eu rules we just have to agree to the pertinent ones um, so if we want free trade in goods, we have to agree to the rules on standards, for example. That would be one. For services, however, I would say that, yes, it would surely have to include move, free movement of people. The right of, for people to live and work um, and move across between the UK and the EU freely surely has to. In fact, it does have to. I know that. Um, the last one here. Says, Phil, you are missing the point. Any deal done with anyone has to be better than what we have already. Not similar or close, but better. Any deal they do and come back to the House of Commons and say, look at our shiny new deal. If it is the same or worse, then they failed. Yes, um, but perception in politics, I'm afraid, is everything. I think that used to be the point. If you asked Brexiteers, in all seriousness, Four years ago, is Brexit going to give us better deals? Are we going to get better deals? They would have said yes. They had to. That was what they based their belief on. If you ask them now, a lot of them say no. A lot of them say no, we know we can't get better trade deals. But that's not what it was about. What it was about has changed. You know, many of them have for some months now, in fact, best part of a year, accepted. You've even had government ministers quite happy to accept, Nigel Farage quite happy to accept, that actually the trade deals will be worse the, and we'll, we will suffer. Our economy will contract as a result of Brexit. But that's not what it's about. No, you're missing the point, Phil. It's all about sovereignty. Which apparently means making up our own rules. So then we have to wonder, so 
Brexit was about getting better trade deals. Now it's not. Now it's about making our own rules. So then next year, when we have to follow World Trade Organization rules and we and then people like me will be pointing out, OK, so we can't make up that rule because the World Trade Organization says no. Oh, yeah, Boris Johnson says he wants that. But the World Trade Organization says no. So then it won't be about making our own rules either because we won't be make, we'll demonstrably not be making our own rules because we'll have to conform to the World Trade Organization rules that they all championed. So then Brexit will become something different. I'm looking forward to seeing what that is. But anyway, those are my thoughts and yours. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments below. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, don't forget to click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, please also click the Patreon link for details. And until next time, I'll see you later.